defense that we have is Jesus Christ. And it's the only defense that you need. You know, if somebody says, ah, oh, you're a sinner. Yes, but Christ is my righteousness. That is my one defense. So, um, anyways, let's go ahead and turn to James chapter 1. We're going to continue on uh, with our uh, series here, talking to James. We're dealing with kind of problems and troubles and, you know, having a hard time in life, right? Last week was, life is hard, right? Yes. Uh, but some things we need to remember to get us through that time. And today, uh, we're going to talk about the right way to respond. How many of you know that there's a right way and a wrong way to respond? Nobody's raising their hand. Nobody's ever responded the wrong way. I tell you, I respond the wrong way sometimes. And, and, and that's kind of what we're going to look at today. We're going to find out the right way to do things versus the wrong way. Um, and, and I... <laughs> It's funny that I found an illustration and it just happened to be a pastor's story. So the title of the illustration is called The Pastor's Road Rage. I'm a calm driver, ask my wife. Just before Christmas, my whole family piled into our kid moving vehicle and rushed to the nearest mall to grab some last minute Christmas presents before dashing to a holiday party. As usual, we were running late and we were slightly on edge. Entering the mall parking lot, I was overwhelmed by the traffic. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted an old pickup truck near the mall entrance, leaving its space. God is so good. Anybody go shopping Christmas Eve? I punched the accelerator and sped toward my answered prayer, hoping to gain a few precious extra seconds. I immediately staked my spot with eye lock. Now, eye lock. Uh, is the ancient practice of claiming a spot by looking directly at it. As long as you don't look away, the spot is yours. Relieved that I might actually avoid the tedium of trolling up and down each aisle, I kept my eyes deadlocked on the spot and prepared for entry. Out of nowhere, a red sports car whipped in front of me, breaking my honorable eye lock and stole my parking space. Unbelievable. Frustrated beyond words, with the pressure mounting because of our tight schedule, I did something that I'm not proud of. I backed my vehicle up, pointed it directly at the red sports car, and shifted to neutral, and revved my engine. Like a drag racer leaving the gate, I popped from neutral to drive and peeled out and shot straight toward the rear of the enemy's car. It's hard to know what happened next. Maybe it was my wife threatening me. Perhaps God answered my kids' prayers. Maybe I realized that I was still in our minivan and not in a NASCAR race car. Whatever the reason, right before impact, I slammed on the brakes and stopped just short of his car. With all the Christian love I had, I rolled down the window and shouted at the top of my lungs, What do you think you were doing? You know I had eye lock, you idiot. Now you're going to make me really late, you red sports car driving loser. After rejoining the other ants, we searched for another 20 minutes and finally found a parking spot somewhere near the state line. We dashed from store to store, breathing heavy in our rush. As we entered J.C. Penney, who should approach us but my old friend, the driver of the red car. Just great. Images of my picture with the headline, Local Pastor Assaults Man Over Parking Space, flashed through my mind. I can tell you're in a big hurry, he said, as my blood pressure continued to rise, but it appears you have more going on in your life than you can handle. My wife gave me the remember you're a pastor, better behave look, as the driver continued. I'd like to tell you about someone who could really help, Jesus. I believe you really need him, and he can change your life. Ouch. Right, so there's a wrong way and a right way to respond Two things. Uh, we're going to find out today, we're going to talk about this passage in James. As a matter of fact, um, in the Lot household, we're pretty cool on our tempers. Not. My brothers and me, my sister, she's innocent, but we all have tempers. And we're going to learn kind of a little bit uh, about how to handle things in life, the right way to respond when we have pressures and troubles in our life. Uh, there's a paradox in our time. Um, somebody wrote this and I just kind of copied it. It says, we learn how to make a living, but not a life. 
We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet our new neighbor. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not better. You see, that's the thing that I key on right there. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space, right? Um, what does the uh, prophet tell us about the human heart? That it's desperately wicked, above all else we could know it, but God. You know, if we're really honest with ourselves, our heart is unruly. And the truth of the matter is this, is that most of our battles, they're not uh, on the outside, right? But most of our battles happen on the inside, right? And that's what we're going to talk about. And as a matter of fact, the greatest challenge in our lives sometimes that we find is not dealing with things, but as we look in the mirror, it's that person staring back at us. The man in the mirror, right? We... What's, what's on the inside we find that matters most. And, and when we take a look at this letter of James, it was written 2,000 years ago. Um, it was written to these scattered and oppressed believers across uh, Jerusalem and, and throughout uh, Israel. And they're barely hanging on to their faith at this time. And, and when you think about it, it really applies to us and our lives in the 21st century. It is so relevant to us. James wants us to discover the freedom that comes when we learn to respond to things the right way, the way that God would want us to do it. You know, how do you respond when, you know, the pressure's just coming upon you? How do you respond when the, when the heat is on? You know, they say that um, it's when you squeeze a man and really find out what's inside of him. Right? I think when we were uh, first uh, preaching here, I said one of the ways to find your pastor was to invite him to a softball game, right? And then at a close play at second base, call him out when he's really safe and see how he would respond. <laughs> it's how we respond on the inside. So here's James' answers. If you look at that first chapter, verses 19 and 20, where we were looking at, and it says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person... Anybody escape that? Every person comment? I don't think so. I think that includes all of us, right? Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. And we thank you for your word, Lord God, that tells us and teaches us how to respond in a godly way. To achieve uh, godly righteousness. May we pay attention to this passage today that speaks to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when we look at that, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Pretty straightforward. But how does it work out in your daily life? Let's take a look at these three commands that James uh, lists for us. The first one, right, in verse 19, it says, let every person be quick to hear. Another way to see that is that we need to be ready to hear. We need to be ready to listen. You see, when we begin to think about wisdom, and I'm going to tell you that wisdom is applying godly knowledge to our lives and making the right choices. So when we need to hear to get godly wisdom, the wisdom begins when we begin to listen more and talk less. And this sort of wisdom, right, it has to do with one thing, listening to the Word of God. I'm thankful here that... Um, I sincerely believe in teaching line by line through the Bible to where you can follow along with it. You can see that what I am saying comes right from God's Word. I'm not adding anything to it. I'm not taking anything away from it. A lot of places don't do that. They take the Word of God, set it aside, and preach a feel-good message, and walk out of church feeling great. And then when daily pressures hit, you don't know what to do. But here's what God has to say. You see, when you think about this letter of James, and, and many scholars, as a matter of fact, most of your scholars um, on the Bible say that this is the first letter written. All right? So if this is the first letter written, what are they listening to? What part of the Word of God are they hearing? Not just the Old Testament, but what they did is they gathered together around the uh, apostles and those who had been around the apostles, 
to hear the things that God had taught. You see, because none of the uh, letters that Paul had wrote were written yet, none of the Gospels were written yet, but yet as they gathered together, they were able to hear the Word of God preached and taught. The things that Jesus taught them. And you see, hearing meant meeting with other believers and listening to the Word. How many of you guys, other than here, meet with other people to hear the Word of God? You see, here's the thing. We have so much technology today. So much technology that I can go to my phone, pull up a Bible, and I've got it right in front of me. Right? Or I could go to any app, any podcast, and listen to somebody teaching. There's so much out there nowadays that we get listening and we're not even hearing what's being said. How many of you will list, have music going in the background and you're not really even hearing it, but yet you're listening to it? That's the way that we get in our lives. And the problem is, is this, is that we need to be in a place where we're hearing God's word, Here's a tough one. Memorizing God's Word, right? And meditating upon it. The psalmist wrote, Thy Word I have hidden in my heart. That's memorization. That's being ready to hear the Word of God. Because when you're put into a situation and you don't have your smartphone with you and you don't have your Bible in your hand, oh, but you can remember the Word of God. You put the fear slow to speak and slow to anger, but the anger man does not achieve it, right? I had to learn that a long time ago because I was a hot man. And when we be able to do that, when we're able to have God's word in us and we're taking that time, we are ready to hear what he is saying. And that's what's important. You see, the thing about technology, it's made it so easy to hear that often we don't even hear what God is saying. We're always on our phones and we don't have time for anybody else. I seriously have to make an effort sometimes to put my phone down when my wife and I go to dinner so that I can make sure that I'm there. How many of you are like that? You have a problem with your phone? Sometimes we do that. I love watching the little videos that people are on their phone and they're walking into the poles and walking into the fountain in the middle of the mall, right? I mean, that's just how distracted we get. We need to stop. Stop and take time to hear what God is saying. And, and, and that brings a question. Who is better off? James and his company? Or us today with all the technology we have? Well, we're not going to trade our technology. But look, they really had to make an effort to be ready to hear the word of God. One thing that we do know here is that Has anybody ever been in an argument and you're thinking about what you're going to say next? And you're thinking so hard about what you're going to say next, you can't even hear what's being said. Uh, you, it, it doesn't matter what you're saying, I'm just getting my next comeback ready. You see, you're not being ready to hear. Um, write this Proverbs chapter 8. All right, now Proverbs chapter 8 is, you can go back and read it sometime, but it really deals with godly wisdom, all right? Godly wisdom. Again, godly wisdom is being able to act the way God would want us to act. Wisdom calls, verse 1. Verse 6 says that she speaks noble things. Godly wisdom is better than silver and gold. Verse 15 says, by wisdom kings reign. God blesses those who walk in wisdom. That's in verse 32. Verse 35 says that wisdom gains favor from the Lord. You see, you don't gain wisdom by chance. It's something that doesn't come by accident. You can't be too busy or too worried with life. You can't be too preoccupied or too distracted when it comes to the things of God. But you have to be ready to seek God's wisdom in His Word. Be quick to hear. Another uh, form of the Greek word that says being quick is found in John chapter 20 verse 4. I love this verse because it talks about men um, the way that a man is. Um, John 20 verse 4 says this, 
uh, is speaking of Peter and John, right? When two men are walking someplace, it's cool, but when you're trying to get there first, it all of a sudden turns into a race, right? Because this is what John says in his, in his letter. He says, both of them, Peter and John, were running together. They were heading for the tomb, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So John just told us that he's faster than Peter. But, but in that passage, that word outran is the same word for quick in, in our passage. You see, are we outrunning ourselves, being quick to hear the word of God? You see, that's what you've got to do. You've got to be able to outrun yourself. We're quick to do things that don't matter. My question for you is, do you have a plan to hear the word of God? I'm not just talking about coming here. Okay. I'm talking about in your life, at home. Uh, one of the plans that uh, I would, uh, saw when I was studying for this message was this one. It's really quick and simple. No Bible, no breakfast. Because I tell you, in the morning you're hungry and you're going to want to eat and spend that time in God's Word before you do it. So that's the first thing that James tells us. The way that we need to respond is we need to be ready to hear the Word of God. When life is hard, when troubles are mounting and the pressure is coming on you, how do we respond? We're quick. We're ready to hear what God has to say. The second thing is this. Talk less. Some of us, that's hard. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This is what it says. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Talk less. You see, here comes the real truth is this, is that we are not as smart as we think we are. Right? We're not as clever as we think we are. We're not as wise as as we think we are. Sometimes there's a time to speak, and sometimes there's a time just to be quiet. Proverbs 29, 20 says this, Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for him. You see, it, it's time sometimes just to zip it. We rarely want to do that in our lives. Now, um, in in a marriage, some things that I am learning, and it's funny because this guy wrote this little poem. It says this, to keep your marriage brimming with love and the loving cup, whenever you are wrong, admit it. And whenever you are right, shut up. You see, we always want to keep talking. You see, you can kill any relationship with unkind words. We need to be ready to hear the Word of God, and we need to be slow to speak. Social media makes it so hard sometimes. Has anybody sent an email that you want back after you sent it? You know what? You can't get it back. Whenever you post something on social media, it's there forever. Sometimes we need to write something, read it, cool down, read it again, and then decide if you want to see Once you post it, it's gone. Somebody said that if you speak when you are angry, you will make the best speech that you'll forever regret. Many times I have spoken before thinking. And I said, did not more than you can chew. And you see, in our lives, when it comes to these hard times in our lives, we have to be ready to talk less. 
you know, for into the Word of God, for getting godly wisdom, speak less. That's the second thing that James tells us. The third one that comes along says this. He says, to be quick to hear, slow to speak. The last one is slow to anger. Calm down. Don't, one, of the, one translation said this, don't get worked up into a rage so easily. Now what James is not telling us, he's not telling us to be angry, right? Because that would be so unrealistic. Think about Christ. Christ at one time got angry, right? He began turning tables and made a whip and drove people out of the temple. He had a righteous anger against things that were happening to God. So James isn't telling us not to have anger. It's an emotion that's given us to, that has been given to us by God. But what he's telling us is that that anger that he's speaking here is this deep-seated rage. Have you ever known anybody that wakes up in the morning mad, eats breakfast mad, goes to work mad, comes home mad? Goes to bed, Matt, he's just mad all the time. Some people think he's good, yeah, I know he's a person. Now, what a shame. But it's that deep seated rage that he's talking about. It's like a volcano that erupts. That, has anybody ever said, oh, sorry, I couldn't help myself? One of the fruits of the Spirit is self control. So if we are erupting like a volcano, guess what we're not walking in? Anger is something that we can control. Does anybody believe that? Have you ever been in an argument? Back, you're heated, it's mad, it's going on, it's back and forth. You're, you're in a good, you're right, you're not going to give up type of an argument. And the phone rings. Oh, hi, how are you doing? So good to hear from you. Oh, we love you too. Oh, come call back soon. Okay. Bam, hang up the phone and it's back on again. Oh, wait a minute. You've just shown that you can control your anger. So anger is something that we can control. And I want you to see the progression of what's going on here. If we're quick, quick to hear, we will be slow to speak, which leads to less anger. However, being slow to hear leads to quick speaking. Quick speaking leads to quick anger. Have you ever noticed this? The matter you get, the faster you talk. Now, some people be wanting to be an auctioneer. They're so mad. But that's just the way that the progression of doing something the wrong way. We have to be slow to anger. We've got to be able to pull on your beer, let the pressure out, do something. Calm down. That's the way that James is telling us to handle those tough times in life. If you look at the character, and I'm just going to say the character of a godly man, but it's also of a, a godly person, a godly woman. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1, Right, we go through those whole list of characteristics that a, a deacon must be, but it's actually if you can supplant that with a godly person. There's five things in that list that really deal with our temperament and the way that we handle things. Five of those characters. Now, don't be overbearing, don't be quarrelsome, don't be quick-tempered, not to be violent, but to be gentle. Right? Those are all characteristics, godly characteristics. When the time, when the pressure begins to build, sometimes the first thing to go is godly thinking. And that is the time that is most important for us to begin to think the way that God would want us to. And I need to be ready to hear what God has to say. I need to be slow to speak. I, I can't be shooting my mouth off. Because it's really going to get me into trouble. But I also, I need to calm down. Because that's the way God would want me to do. That's the fruit of the Spirit being in under self-control. Proverbs 16.32 Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. We all want to be known as a warrior, not as a patient man. We all want to be known as a tough person. But James says, that it's better to be calm than mindful. And that's the way we need to live our life. 
And out of the three commands that James gives, this is the only one that he gives a reason for because he knew it would be tough for us to handle. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. You see, we all have short little fuses. And that's the thing that James wants us to get. He says this about that command. He adds this reason. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Do you get this? That if you are angry, you cannot do the things that God wants you to do. We need to be about God's business. You see, being angry will never produce anything that is pleasing to God. And when I say anger, I'm talking about that violent, erupting volcano that will flow out of our mouths. Have you ever seen anybody that is angry like that build anybody up? You see, that anger only tears people down. It leads to jealousy, harsh words. What does Jesus say about anger? Murder. Anger like that can lead to murder. When I was a kid, my mom used to sing this song, Ephesians 4:32. We need to take this to heart. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And you see, you need to understand that when it comes to these three issues, when it comes to anger. We need to have grace. And we as Christians need to understand grace better than anybody else because we've been given grace. How many of us deserve Christ to die on the cross for us? Not me. And you see, God did that for us. He extended grace to us. We can do for others what God has done for us. If God in Christ has forgiven you, and I can forgive somebody else. The truth is you can't understand God's love unless you go to the cross. And you can't understand the cross unless you know God's love. You see, God's love is so great that He did send His Son to die for each and every one of us. That's grace. That's what I can extend to somebody else when I get angry at them. When the pressure is building and I get mad at somebody else. Grace is something that needs to take control of me. Man's murder became God's sacrifice. Think about it. A crime paid the ultimate debt. Them killing Christ paid my debt. Jesus didn't come here to make us nicer people. He came here to make us new people. And just like the man in the red sports car told that pastor, you need to have Jesus living in you. He can change you. Well, that's the truth for each and every one of us. That Christ in us makes all the difference. And when it comes time to to times of trouble, it's not my patience, it's not my understanding that will make a situation better, but it's Christ. His patience, His kindness, His love, His courage, His wisdom in me. That's what will make me respond the right way. If you believe, let's say we believe, that in Christ dwells the fullness of God, and we do. If we believe that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, and we do. What does that say? That this week in my life, Christ dwelling in me, His fullness, His beauty, His grace, His mercy, His holiness is all inside of me. Do you believe that? How is that going to cause us to live in these situations in our life that will make us want to respond the right way? See, when we are living in Christ and Christ in us, then by God's grace, we will be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. 
Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. For this passage here, Lord God, that James wrote to us about how to respond in our lives when the times are hard, when the pressure is building in my life, and I don't know what to do. Father, let me be ready to hear your word, what you have to say to me. Let me be slow to speak, Father, and let me lean upon Christ dwelling in me to be slow to anger. For in that, I will be ready to love those around me more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.